I am part of a book club, the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. Our Friday night book club became a refuge to us during the occupation by the Germans. People don't realise that the Channel Islands were occupied during the Second World War. Certainly for the generation we're here, a lot of them didn't really ever want to talk about it very much. But now time's moved on and it's an important part of our history. Finally I'll have something serious to write. In 1941, Hitler gave the, an order for the making of the Channel Arms into impregnable fortresses. Just before the occupation was an evacuation. The Guernsey Evening Press for Wednesday, June the 19th. This was the day when at very short notice, parents had to report to the schools if they wanted their children to be evacuated. There had been a realization in the island that we have a very small land area here, 24 square miles. We had about 40,000 population. No way could the land area sustain the entire population. Also, they were afraid of, to be honest, German atrocities, bombing raids, get the children away. There was panic right through. People who wanted to go were being called yellow and rats deserting a sinking ship and all this sort of thing. I desperately wanted to go and Dad and Mum um, said, well, it will only be for about three weeks. <laughs> and um, of course, nobody knew a thing. 10 o'clock at night, we were lined up on the White Rock with um, supposedly one suitcase each. The list of what we were to take was actually printed in the newspaper. Just basic clothes, very, very little. On the island, about half of the population, 20,000 left and 5,000 children left. In a way, it was a good thing that they had gone, so we were allowed to have maybe a little present in Christmas, some of their books or toys and also clothing. Shoes was always very short. Even you can't fight the Germans, miss, when they come. And they might come to England too. Give your hand. My father was given this in the Great War for courage. We knew it was inevitable the Germans would come. Guernsey was the main hub of the German command structure in the Channel Islands. On a small island of approximately nine miles by three, we have got nearly upwards of a thousand German bunkers or some type of German fortification. It was a, a death trap for anyone trying to attack. When the Germans were here, they built an enormous amount of fortifications, tunnels, gun emplacements. And of course, after the occupation, if you came back to your farm or your property and they built something in the garden or underneath your house, or uh, in one case, they built a huge complex of tunnels underneath the church, that became yours. One of the big tunnel complexes that were built was the German underground hospital. And the Germans built it, part of it as a hospital, and part of it is an ammunition store. It's a mile and a quarter of underground tunnels. When the Germans first arrived, they arrived two days after they bombed the harbour. Oh, shame on all of you! Elizabeth! Shame for Poland! For France! No, no, no. Guernsey! No. Shame! Come here. I was riding along the banks of the island and I saw this plane very, very low, sort of on the water. And uh, when it turned its wings, I noticed it was a German plane. I didn't know what was going to happen. There were 34 men on the harbour who were killed. And these are the pictures that were taken at the time showing the devastation of the lorries. And this is the plaque that was erected to commemorate the names of the men who were killed. Really awful, frightening, yeah. Didn't know what one day, next day would, would happen. Yeah, it was one of those, and five years was so long. After June 1942, all radios had been confiscated. You had our papers, of course, heavily censored. This is where the crystal sets, the cat's whisker sets come in. There was the Guernsey Underground news sheet. The Germans would come to search the house. They were looking for a crystal set, for instance. They would 
look everywhere. Very, very little communication, of course, throughout the war. About six months apart, we had a 25-word maximum Red Cross message, which had taken six months to get through anyway, because it had to go to Switzerland and be um, censored. We'd have the old friends come home and we used to put them over the wall of the gardens after curfew. These lanes were very handy for them to sneak from one place to another and not be caught. They often had high hedges either side or walls and they couldn't be seen. We used to play tricks on the Germans. We used to wrap up parcels. And we had a house with a big granite farmhouse and we used to chuck stuff over the granite wall and then watch them as they came along and found a parcel and opened it up and it had something really quite unpleasant in it, probably, but we were screaming with laughter at this. We thought it was funny. My father-in-law was um, headmaster, and these are the two schools he was on the students he was looking after. He was appalled how hungry the children were when they came to school. Some of them came to school, and all they had for their lunch was fried potato peelings. There's potato cake here, and there's potato peel. There's all sorts of combinations. This is uh, made from, by, from a water occupation recipe of my mother-in-law's, and it is minced potato and minced potato peel with a little bit of onion minced in with it. Sugar beet also was a very popular crop grown. Um, we just had to live basically on vegetables. If you had a litter, most of them had to go to the Germans. We never gave the Germans anything. We kept it to ourselves. Kept everything hidden. My mother used to queue up for three hours most mornings in the market in case food came in, half a swede or parsnip, carrots, so that she could make some kind of soup in the evening. But we had funny, strange things. I remember pudding, which they said was a sort of rice pudding. Well, it had potatoes in it, actually. It was revolting and carrageen moss, which came from the beach until they mined all the beaches, and that you made gelatine from. Yeah, they meant fishing. Oh, you weren't allowed to go on the beach at all. The slipways, you know, had openings that were all sealed up. And there, here and there, they had steps on the sea wall to get down. They smashed them all up, the Germans. Everybody was starving, absolutely starving, including, of course, the German there was a workforce of 10,000 working on the construction simultaneously throughout the Channel Islands and they were in some cases very forced to work and their conditions were very poor. But they were slaves, thousands of them, sent by the Reich to labor from Poland, Russia, worked all day and all night. They were kept in pens with the sun beating down on them, the rain. I sowed some beet in the greenhouse, parsnips and different things. And one night they vanished. The foreigners and Germans probably had pinched them. By November 1944, things were so serious that the Germans agreed to contact the International Red Cross with having the Red Cross parcels that saved many lives, many died. I've seen things I never thought could happen, happen. There's a message from our bailiff to say you can fly your flags at 3 p.m. this afternoon. Actual Liberation Day was the following day. Dear Channel Islands are to be free, Winston Churchill. And we got to these soldiers, 22 of them, that's all. And there was perhaps two or three hundred of us, and we were hugging them, kissing, crying. I had left as a, a small child in a gym slip, came back in my um, tweed suit and, and Cuban heeled shoes, looking for my parents. My father had been a 16 stone, very, very enthusiastic sportsman. It took me some time to realize that this man who'd shrunk to nine stone um, and looked awful, uh, was actually my father. And my mother, um, suddenly this white-haired old lady, was my mother. These are um, the Liberation Day 
photographs. Really quite interesting this one because these are Guernsey men and you can see how thin they are. And this is a British soldier who came part, as part of the liberating forces who happened to be a Guernsey man. They let him come, um, but you can see the difference. He's really quite well fed and uh, healthy looking, whereas the poor Guernsey men are very, very thin. After liberation, day or two after, he said, why don't you write to Winston Churchill? So I said, yes, all right, Dad, I mean, it's to write. And I wrote to him and then after, it was a week or so after, it was in the newspaper, the letter said, I have been deeply touched by all the messages of goodwill which have received me at this time. Thank you so much for your kind thought, Winston Churchill, May 1945. I think it's an important thing that we do keep remembering and talking about. And of course, we still celebrate Liberation Day, May the 9th every year.